I'm recording now. This is Tracy Preston, and we're going to be looking at CSS, CBA, and CISO. So 30 minutes or so on the first two subjects and an hour on CISSO. So I, my understanding is the intentions of this session is to just go through some preparation. So I figured we'd go through the prep guide. And so I'm just going to kind of move through this and hit the high points. So with the CSS, first starting now with Chapter 1 in your prep guide, uh, basic security, how to secure a computer for personal Internet use. And we really have to get an idea of what our issues are. I mean, for one, there, there are a lot of risks just being on a computer. I mean, being on a, a Microsoft C machine, I think sometimes even creates more risk because they're so popular. And hackers are very interested in, you know, as getting as many people as they can with viruses. And since there's so many Windows people, and that that's a, that's a great target. Now, a person who has a Mac computer could still get harmed. They're not completely immune from it. But they, there tends to be a little less risk overall, perhaps, for the Mac person from a virus perspective. But still, I mean, everybody gets some sort of risk. I mean, they're talking about attackers printing, pretending they're a legitimate company and getting your information. I mean, people have a tendency to trust. So they may think that that's a legitimate site. And, you know, risk of that happening, we may not know or even happening to us. We have, you know, remote access could be occurring. There could be, you know, these sites that say, hey, we've got some Microsoft updates, but they're not really from Microsoft and they're probably really bad for our system you know, cookie information, and, and some cookies that websites put on your system stay. And we, and they actually are a bit invasive because they do look at your system. They look at your likes. They know what you've searched for. They remember things. I, I believe it can actually affect pricing. I've gotten heard some evidence of that from various people and, and seen some things that make me think that at least. Now, root kits, keystroke loggers, I mean, sometimes just going, you know, a user just being very trusting and going to you know, various sites that haven't necessarily been confirmed as being safe, they may get infected with malware. And remember, the, the root kits can get on your systems, and that's like a complete access to your system. And you may not even realize it because they're so stealth-like. They're able to hide their presence. I mean, there could be processes running on your computer that when you go and look at the processes, you don't see them, and they're just they're like hidden. And then, of course, the lot of malware, there's a keystroke logging function where it can actually record what you're typing in. And then that, that could be passwords, usernames. So, I mean, and also it's kind of an interesting thing. They say things you need to know. Did you know that if someone were to access the Internet from your home and a crime was committed, the odds are that you would be held responsible? I mean, we have to watch what people even do on our systems. We may say that, well, I didn't do it. It was somebody else in my house. But it's going to be, you know, kind of a fight right there legally trying to, you know, get excused from that because there's a good possibility it could be held accountable. And, I mean, there's all kinds of goals I think hackers have. I mean, for one, they could look at identity theft. And with identity theft, they're trying to get our bits and pieces of our information, you know, our name with their social security number, with the credit card numbers, and anything they can get a hold of that can be used to impersonate us. Okay? And, of course, um, we have to be careful with that information. I mean, I'm so surprised at people. I was commenting just today. Uh, uh, someone I know put on Facebook, it wasn't so much identity theft, but it could be household theft. Because she gets on Facebook and first mentions, yes, I'm going to Kansas for a trip. I'm cleaning up and getting my house ready because I'm leaving. And then, then she takes a picture of herself today and says, driving to Kansas. Okay, so that means right there your house is ready for theft. A different type of theft. But you've alerted people that you're not even going to be there. And we do foolish things with other pieces of information, you know, like the like our social security number. I've seen people on Facebook also take pictures of their driver's license number, uh, their actual driver's license, and with another piece of documentation, well, why are you doing this? We don't need to help them along, okay? We have to be aware of what's going on, that people do want our information, and, you know, I guess pay attention to maybe keep our credit report, and kind of pay attention to that. There are some services that help with that in case someone did try to do some sort of identity theft. And, you know, here, kind of looking through some questions, each of these have a little question-answer section. 
and with this to say there are ways of accessing your system with attackers pretending they're a legitimate company to learn your private information. When we look at that, I mean, oh yeah, absolutely, that's so true. Okay. And then continuing with this, blank occurs when someone uses your personally identifiable information like your name, social security number, or credit card number. And then we have some choices to pull from. Okay, identity theft, obviously. Okay. And with bits and pieces of our information put together I mean, could be taken advantage of by someone else who wants to you know, put credit cards out in their name, or well, in our name, and they use them looking like us. And you know, it's not like a lot of people necessarily ask to see your identifications. Like, show me your driver's license, prove to be this is you. Just kind of depends. True or false, the FTC estimates there are as many as 10 million Americans have their identities stolen each year. And I'm sure in rising, yes, absolutely. It just keeps getting to be higher and higher when it comes to these offenses. Okay. Then we get on to Chapter 2, looking at user awareness. And it's, it's, it's such a simple little thing, but yet people fall for it. You know, social engineering, tricking people into giving out personal information relating to, but not limited to identity, username, usernames, passwords, just, you know, anything about you. And, and we have to keep our passwords secure. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. And with this, they, they recommend that you do change your passwords at least every 30 to 60 days. To, you know, in case someone does get a hold of your password, maybe there was some sort of keystroke logger, or maybe you just wrote it down or told somebody, but at least if you change it, you know, they knew your password, but maybe they don't know it now because you changed it. And it's recommended that you never use whole words or common dates, addresses, especially non-identification numbers. Now, you could use one of those password generator programs, although sometimes those are super random and hard to remember. They also talk about using potentially an e-wallet stores your passwords into a file that no one can read without the master password, which better be really good. And you can use a USB key that is on a key ring, okay? So you always have them with you, not on the computer. So that's one option also. Do not use the autofill in Windows. People do that. They will, they let the system kind of default, and it will, sometimes it will ask them, and they'll allow it to remember what they typed in. So a lot of times you'll notice it because you'll type in maybe the first number or the first character of a field and watch it fill in the rest of it and you go, oh my, I remembered. And that's not a really good place either. I mean, someone could get a hold of your computer and you just, a lot of people I think feel that, well, my computer's in my house and it's not going to get stolen. It's safe and everything. But then, you know, you could have a robbery. Someone could come in and uh, have enough time, especially like the person who said they were on their way to Kansas right now. They could, uh, you know, if they knew this person, they could be malicious and go to their house and uh, start stealing their electronics. And, you know, and if you've got the autofill in, that it not only got your computer, they now can get on your computer and uh, have the logins for maybe credit card sites and all kinds of things. So personal information already given up. You can use uh, biometrics using a fingerprint reader, smart card readers. Smart cards can hold passwords. We see that in the military environment. Okay, so you you want to make sure you are changing your passwords. As the further away from your system your passwords are, the harder they are to steal. So in other words, try not to put them on a sticky note on your monitor, underneath your keyboard, or anything like that. And you know the main account that's got all the power in a Windows computer is obviously administrator, and this absolutely needs a password. And this is your, your main account. You try not to log in as administrator on a regular basis except when you need it. It would be better to have like a regular user account also. And another thing with your system, it's, it's good to look at your processes that are running. So each time you reboot your computer system, check for the process at launch before to ensure that no one else has set a process to start without your knowledge, like some piece of software may have been put on there. When they're talking about this, and you could go to task manager and you can actually see your processes and they even have they can potentially show a process identifier a process ID process identifier and essentially you just go to processes and you can say view select columns 
and you can tell if you're if you're looking at yours and going, well, I don't have a process ID. You can just go to processes, view, select columns, click it on PPID, and then you can see it. And there's some utilities out there that will let you uh, you basically let you go ahead and kill a process, and you can use it from a command line. And it's good to have the the number there. There's another utility, just to mention some utilities real quick. I mean, it's called MS Config. And with MS Config, you can go look at your startup and see any uh, services, anything that's auto starting. Because you might find something in here you don't need, and you could click them off and, and basically not disable all, but disable the ones you want to disable. Plus, you can look at services a little closer if you want to. Okay. So, if you, you just basically research any processes that you're not sure of. It would be really nice if people would look at their computer before they get too far along with, you know, adventuring through different websites and maybe uh, get an idea of what's normal. It would not hurt to do like a print screen of it and print that out so you at least have some something to look at and say, this is normal and this is what I have now. So with this, you know, just kind of looking at the process. Sys Internals has a really a lot of nice tools. And also, you know, you can find out if these processes should not be there. Uh, maybe you look at, you know, there might be a program that caused the process that you can remove. There could be, you know, just a matter of going into MS Config and stopping any sort of auto start processes that you see there. Or even looking at services sometimes is, is a good thing. So, um, you know, if it's, a, it's a process that's a nature of some sort of um, malware, spyware then you, know, you could use some of your you know, good software for that, uh, such as um, Spybot Search and Destroy, uh, Malware Bytes. I like that one a lot. Windows has a you know, so-called antivirus and also ma anti-malware built into it called Defender. I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of tools that kind of cross over. Okay, and of course, you know, we also, you know, systems that may not be up to date or patched properly, that could definitely cause a problem. Because then you have a weakness. The reason the patches was put out there is because there was some sort of uh, vulnerability that hackers have exploits for, and they want to basically try to protect you as much as they can. So uh, yeah, so there's definitely some you know bad sites to be going to, and sometimes you don't even know they're bad sites, and they could be causing problems to your system, changing things in your registry, uh, putting malware on your system. Sometimes the most innocent-looking sites may be malicious. It's not always plainly obvious. I mean, if you go to somewhere like Pirate Bay, and yeah, you know that you've probably messed up. You're going to get malware, but sometimes you're not even aware of it. I remember going to look at just some, um, you know, RVs, Class C, Class B type RVs. It was just looking around and Google searched and clicked on a link and a virus came down in my system. You know, you think that would be pretty innocent, but you can really get messed up. So we have to, we think about the countermeasures and really, I mean, the antivirus is good, and, and some tools out there, they, they do claim to be an all-in-one. But you know, it's also really important that people actually run their scans, even doing full scans. I have noticed with some of my software, when I let the software just do its own routine scan, it doesn't elect to do a full scan unless I tell it to. And I thought it was safe, but then when I ran a full scan, found that I wasn't clean after all, because the routine scan really wasn't sufficient, so maybe tell it to do a full scan. Uh, you may not want to do it while you're doing something else that's resource intensive because it could actually pull the system down and much, make it much slower, but the recommending scans need to be done at least once a week on lightly used systems, and the computers are almost being used more than four or five hours a day, then do it multiple times a week. You could do something like that. Now, they're talking about questions pertaining to this, true or false? Social engineering is tricking normal people into giving out personal information relating to, but not limited to, identity, usernames, passwords, and general information. Oh yeah, and of course you're just working, working the human factor here. Okay. Now this part, how often should you change your password? And as far as what was recommended, and they were basically, you know, recommending the 30 to 60 days. That way, at least someone got your password, at least you change it, and now they no longer have access. Okay? Each time you reboot your computer system, you want to check the processes at launch to ensure that no one has set a process to start without your knowledge. 
Ideally, yes. I'm sure a lot of us don't do that, but we should at least, you know, it's recommended that we check it each time. At least take a peek real quick and see what the processes are. Now, Chapter 3, Using the Internet at Work. Okay, It's really hard to say, employee, you can't have any internet whatsoever. And I, I feel like I've got my hands tied behind my back if I have to do a class without internet. Not because I want to sit there and surf and check my Facebook or anything. It's, it's because I use it as a resource. I use it a lot to show visuals and you know, examples, and things like that, to kind of reinforce some material and sometimes look at products that might be an example of what we're talking about. So it's really got a legitimate use, but also you know, we, we find that employees might be plain. They may be less productive because they like to play on eBay, look for auctions of things to buy. They like to play on their social media, Twitter, and all these different things. Uh, so we don't really want to lessen the productivity with these things. Uh, we don't want to cause a loss of availability of the company's network. And of course, a liability of what are they looking at? What are they getting into? Now, we're supposed to have what we call an, an acceptable use policy. So if you want to lessen your liability as a company, for employees' actions, they're recommending making your people sign an, an acceptable use policy, AUP. And that way, there's no mystery. You say, this is okay. This is not okay. And then when they do something that's not okay, you can essentially say, well, you signed this. You knew. You knowingly and with intent did this. <laughs> Yeah, you got you're in a lot of trouble here. You know, you were aware of it. So you they can't claim ignorance said it didn't know. All right, and of course, Internet Basics. We know that we use Internet for a lot of things, such as email. We get to the web, storing files, Dropbox, things like that, file transfers, chat. I mean, they're, they're, they're good things. And you know, the Internet is not owned by just one entity. And you know, everything we see with the Internet is, is used as some sort of addressing protocol. And we tend to call it, the protocol suite we use is called TCP IP. Uh, sometimes we just say it's an IP address because that's really what it is. And with this, uh, we have a service called DNS, Domain Name Service, and that's what makes it so much easier to resolve from name to IP address. We don't have to go around and remember the IP address for Microsoft.com. We just go to Microsoft.com, and magic, it works, and that's because it's a DNS. And clients and servers use these protocols to connect to each other, and it just um, you know, there's no telling who we're connecting to sometimes. It says most corporate networks connect to the Internet. And obviously users don't have a clue. They're not necessarily computer guru savvy types. And they may be completely unaware of the dangers out there. And, you know, they may see something come up on their screen and they just, like, click, okay, continue anyway. I know you just gave me a security warning, but just forget that. Just continue anyway. And then maybe they have the assumption that the company is going to protect them. And it says, if I can do it, it must be allowed. I mean, a lot of people, you know, read about it where people can rationalize and say, if, it's, if I can do it, it must be acceptable. Because obviously the company would stop anything from happening that could be uh, a danger, which is obviously not true. Now, threats associated with Internet access, we have mobile code scripting. We see a lot of uh, blocking on scripts because scripts can run routines that we're not even aware of what they're doing. Browser hijacking spyware, and with this essentially, uh, you know, taking over our, our browsers and and maybe something looks like it came from us and it didn't come from us, and of course spying on us as well. Maybe keystroke logging, uh, there's just email, webmail, web storage, incident messaging. I mean, there can be threats found in all of these different areas, and people chat back and forth with instant messaging. Proxy servers, we could be going, hackers could be going through numerous proxies to get from point A to point B. And peer-to-peer -peer is extremely dangerous. I mean, we have to especially be careful, especially, I would say more than anything with the Windows computer. And I'm not trying to down Windows computers at all. But you're asking for trouble, especially with the Windows computer, because was what it is, it's not the Windows, it's the peer-to-peer. -peer. And you're taking a Windows computer there. The peer-to-peer -peer is a risky land. Because a lot of times that's where people get their movies they didn't pay for that they're trying to share, their music they didn't pay for they're trying to share. And so all this free stuff, free software, 
that you know would have cost a premium potentially. And so these sites, people share these things, but they're full of viruses and malware and things that could harm you. And it's, again, it does seem since Windows is so incredibly popular, hackers do tend to make more viruses for the incredibly popular Windows. So it's kind of a compliment in a way that Windows is like the, the main one. But unfortunately, there's a cost there. Of course, you could have these websites that are like rogue web servers. And with that, these web servers are not the real thing. They just kind of look like they're the real thing. And of course, web browsers, we need those. And, you know, of course, you know, we use these different web browsers, whether it be Internet Explorer or Google Chrome or Firefox or Opera, whatever we happen to use. And so to ensure that you were not having any of the fault issues once you start using your web browser, you know, it's just kind of like just saying be careful. If you type in not exactly the right, if you, you, you'll type in what you think is the name of the website, but you type, did a couple letters off, you didn't spell it right. So you end up going to something that's really close to someone else that has like a website that could be harmful to you. They can actually make it so that it has almost the same spelling but just a little different and it may be a look-alike. could be a rogue site that could be harmful to you. Stay in the areas. I mean, if you got a feeling about a site, maybe I shouldn't be there. You probably shouldn't be there. So really do trust your instincts and report what you see. And, you know, there are... These websites you'll see, they use entities like ActiveX and Java, and users typically have no choice on the matter of you know, what's being used. The web development community makes those decisions, and we see that around us. We see ActiveX, we especially with Microsoft. Apps run with the security of the user that's browsing. Therefore, don't log in as admin. <laughs> you know, the higher your credential, the higher your account, the more risk that could happen because of perhaps there's some malicious scripts. And Java, on a cross-platform, and you see Java virtual machines, and, and they always talk about okay, apps running in a Java virtual machine, or also it's called a sandbox, so they're supposed to be kind of isolated, so they stay within this area and can't reach out and interfere with other things. And these apps that are constrained to run in this virtual machine, Java virtual machine, or the sandbox, it is considered a safer way to go. And, you know, people, it's, it's amazing how our computers have gotten faster, our web pages have gotten fancier, and it's just more elaborate, more rich media content. And it, it's really kind of funny when you, you look at how web pages have just gotten so much nicer and it requires so much, much better of a machine to run. And we sometimes don't even think about the bandwidth we're using up. And the fact that, you know, certain activities we do, we're just kind of taking it because of all these really rich media type content web pages, they are more demanding and using more bandwidth. It's like um, more water is being shoved through a hose and there's only so much that will go through there. Okay. So you can have scripted events, you can control the user interface, of course. There's also email. Let me think about that. Uh, employees accessing their email. Uh, big concern, I have a personal email, like they're, they're at their workplace and say, let me go check my Yahoo or my Hotmail. And that's most likely an acceptable use policy that you're not supposed to do that. Very likely. Okay. This is to build, be able to use a web-based mail. And then I guess their concern is when you start reaching out to other areas, you may end up downloading attachments that could be harmful to the environment you're in right now, which could be at work. Chatting, people that do uh, online chatting, they can have attachments too. So attachments can be dangerous. We're not always sure what they're for. And with web, okay, uh, let's see, users no longer need to store their files on their local hard drives. Files are accessible through ActiveX Control or Java, although, you know, usually encrypted. And then some things that are kind of hard to manage the way our environment works and everything. You can have encryption. You can have encrypted communication channels with web proxies. And, and it's just there's a lot out there. People can actually hide their presence even. Uh, they can become more anonymous. They have like these virtual private networks that can be encrypted as well. And it's really tough. If something's encrypted, it's hard for us, the security people, to realize that there's a problem. 
it's hard for us to know what they're really doing because they encrypted it. So we don't really have that, that protection. Peer-to-peer, -peer, and again, I mentioned that. And with that environment, it's a, it's a distributed network of user machines acting like clients and servers because everybody's kind of like on the equal ground. There's not the concept of we're the lowly clients and these are the great servers. No, we're all kind of like equal and we're able to share our information. The theory is maybe I downloaded a movie and then you know other people come on there and then maybe some other people download movies and we all pull from the various users to get those movies and then so some people are giving the movies and some people are pulling the movies down. And or it could be um, software programs, it could be music, and a lot of times these aren't necessarily legal things we're talking about. All right, questions. True or false, employees give employers give employees access to the internet because it serves a business need. Well, I think that's the only reason we're getting it. <laughs> there is a business need. Okay, otherwise they would probably try to keep it from us as employees. What are some threats to internet access? I mean things that can actually cause us harm. Really think about it, all of these are potential problems, some sort of script that runs through the web page. Uh, threats from things we download from our email, proxy servers. Of course, they're mentioning um, browser hijacking, spyware, all these, these things. True or false, organizations should clearly state whether accessing web-based okay, mail is acceptable in the Internet Acceptable Use Policy. Yeah, it should be, it, all this should be clearly stated. We don't want to have a user come back with a usage violation that they can come up with and you can't find if they violated it, if they have done, if you feel like they did something they shouldn't do, it should be an acceptable use policy. If you come back and say, well, you were just supposed to know this because you're supposed to have common sense, that's just not going to fly. It's, it needs to be in writing, so maybe it's something you never thought of, but it does need to get added. All right, so we're at the midpoint as far as uh, changing courses. So we looked at the CSS. We're going to change over to the CBE course. Any uh, questions or thoughts so far? Okay. What I'm uh, switching over to now is a CVA certified vulnerability assessor. This is a prep guide you should have. Okay. And since you guys have all gone through the courses and we've had some review on some of the chapters in the courses, maybe all of them by now, I figure the prep guide's a good place to go for getting you closer to ex your exam. These prep guides are really nice. A lot of times they just consolidate the material and you don't have to flip through so many pages to get the overall content that you desire to get. So it starts with a nice table of content, contents and we're going to look at the Let's go through the chapters. Why a vulnerability assessment? So where we begin. Of course, jump in if you have any questions. Uh, section one here, vulnerability assessment. So as you can see where we're going with it, kind of uh, these objectives that we wish to go through. And really, we think about a vulnerability assessment. I mean, we are identifying, quantifying, prioritizing, or ranking our vulnerabilities that we have on our system. And we do want to look very you know, very close in to our systems and, and look for the weaknesses and, and obviously not go with the idea that if we don't see them and we put our head in the sand, they must not exist. If we close our eyes really tight, we can't see them. No, that's foolish. We want to make sure that we are very diligent with this, looking for weaknesses, technical flaws, vulnerabilities. And of course, there's also, you know, disaster you know, dealing with disasters for one, potential hazards to population, to infrastructure, uh, political, social, economic, economic, uh, environmental fields. And of course, we want to go through and essentially do an examination of this and very systematically looking through this and fairly trying to find our security deficiencies and, and trying to, you know, look what we do have in place, our security measures, and, and see if they're really adequate. And if they're not adequate, trying to make improvements. This is a time to be very critical of what we have so we can make it better for a real situation we could encounter. And of course, benefits of this, I mean, you, you could, I say, intelligently manage vulnerabilities. We have the penetration testers 
you know, you know, these people come in, it could be internal, could be an outside company, that do a penetration testing, which they, they basically play hacker. And this does provide detailed information on actual exploitable security threats. And the idea is to look for the, weak, the vulnerabilities that are actually critical, which ones are just like no big deal, insignificant, which ones maybe our vulnerability assessment tool said was a problem that we looked into and it really wasn't a problem. And, you know, applying patches, mitigating, dealing with this, allowing secu uh, allocating security resources when and where they're needed most. Because we don't want, as a company, to have weaknesses that are really going to not, you know, you know bring our systems down. And it says, what in the cost of network downtime? And if our, our network is down, then we look really, we look really bad. I mean, it could be because of a security breach. I mean, we're coming from a security breach. It costs millions due to IT remediation efforts, lost employee productivity, lost revenue. And it also really, I mean, your customers may have less faith in you after they hear about it, and a lot of times it makes the news if it's a big enough deal. Kind of like the Target incident when Target was hacked. I'm sure that affected them a great deal because people had some concerns about going there and using credit cards at that point. And of course, with anything, if you happen to be in an industry that has regulatory or regulations effectively, you want to make sure that you, you, know, you can use the pen testing to satisfy the auditing and compliance for these regulations. Uh, GLBA, PCI, HIPAA, Sarbanes-Oxley, and especially with certain industries that these apply to, you want, you want to make sure that you've tested them thoroughly because the fines, there are, there's fines you'd have to pay significant you know, fines if you are not compliant. Of course, and we want to keep a good image. We want the company. We want people to think we're, we've got our act together. We have good security. We want our customers happy and trusting in us, goodwill. We want, of course, justify security investments. And when we use our pen testing and we find that we are pretty effective in certain areas, we feel really good about the fact that we must have done something right that we did put some, you know, devices and technology in place to, to try to be um, resistant to being penetrated, being hacked into, because we had, yes, I have antivirus, yes, I have firewalls and intrusion prevention systems, all these wonderful systems we have in place that cannot be, you know, you know, punched through, okay? Set aside prerequisite for cybersecurity insurance. I mean, that's another reason I'm doing a pen test. And of course, when we think about vulnerabilities, I mean, vulnerabilities do need to be documented. These are problems or errors that could be used maliciously to make the system perform in some unintended way. And of course, you know, we don't want these weaknesses. These are ways that a bad guy could potentially punch through. And we want to find a way to do something about that. And of course, compliance, project scoping. Uh, developing the scope of a project and is the early work when we decide what boundaries we will set to limit the work on the project. Boundaries can be defined by things like your physical, you know, are there any physical limits that will exist? What, I mean, maybe in your, not your entire organization was included, only part of it was included in this testing. So you'd have to look at that. How much of the network will get reviewed? How many people will be in, consulted or involved in this? And how many people will be working on the project? Just a lot of little questions that you ask yourself to define your boundaries. And they suggest here that most failed projects, uh, they, they use the term come to grief because the scope of the project was poorly defined to begin with or because the scope was not manageable or allowed to creep until it was out of control. In, in other words, a lot of projects become failed projects and mess up because we did not, we were not strict with this project scoping. We, we, we weren't real clear with it, so it was supposed to be this part of the company and then it ended up sort of stretching to this and stretching to that and it just kind of kept going because we kept adding on more tasks to do that were not well defi defined in the very beginning. So it's very important that we do set the scope, you know, the limits of what we're going to do and what systems and what locations and so on for a network vulnerability project. So you start with the project overview and then develop a project scope document. And the project scope document consists of elements 
on the project overview state, task list, documents that set limits on the task list, and then of course the task list and documents that set limits on the task will be the basis for your project plan. So kind of continues with, I just kind of shows you the project overview statement. Should be one page, simple statements, clear and objectives, what it should contain. We can see, you know, basically a short definition, a couple sentences of your project goals, a list of objectives, success factors, how you determine that it was a success, quantification of the benefits. I mean, a lot of times we're using hard numbers, sometimes financial, you know, figures to come up when we say quantitative. And of course, we may have some, you know, we look at some assumptions of strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats involved with the projects. To keep it simple. And then kind of continuing on with that, assessing current network concerns. And we started kind of thinking about our concerns overall. Uh, we can say all network services, one's in the demilitarized zone. That's a place between the internet and your private network. Have similar circumstances, they rely on layer two and three. Now layer two and three is referring to the OSI model, the data link layer and the network layer protocols for them to work. They run on a host operating system such as Windows, and they must accept a certain amount of connections to do their job. So there, there's a lot to think about, a lot of areas that can be violated here. The fact that many services in the DMZ are not configured with the highest degree of security available and others still have flaws in the code make the running services at all a risk. I mean, you have to do a fair assessment because there, there's so many different areas where there can be weaknesses. The layer two, your switches, layer three, your routers, uh, the computers themselves with the BIOS, with the operating system and so on. And we can have, you know, when we think about that and dig into it, I mean, there could be a vulnerabilities that we find in the, the services that we're running. So there are functional requirements that we call a software development lifecycle, SDLC, to ensure that, you know, everything can be invalidated through a development process. Maybe you're trying to build some software that's going to be put in place. We want to be aware of all of our network services and, you know, checking appropriate sites for known attacks, fixing, uh, and we're looking at patches fixing to fix our known vulnerabilities and so on. So we don't try to run older versions of services. We try not to run older versions of software with the host. And we think about the host, okay, host operating system, we, we might have, you know, Windows XP, Windows Vista 7, Windows 8, Server 2003, Server 2008, 2012, and so on. And of course, no matter which host operating system you're running, there's a risk of other services inherent to the operating system that could be, you know, vulnerable. There's vulnerabilities everywhere. If we took a stand and say we're not going to run anything with a vulnerability in it, we just pretty much would stop running anything, is the, is the, the whole cold hard facts of it. But we try our best to layer our security so we can, you know, make it as strong as possible. Now, uh, vulnerabilities in the protocols used, I mean, you still have, you know, protocols with weaknesses throughout the seven layers of the OSI model. So yeah, this is why ARP cache poison is such a devastating attack when it can be employed because typical layer seven services pay, pay no attention to basically what MAC address was a source of it. And in other words, what's going on at the top of the OSI models of layer seven application is not paying attention to what's going on down at layer two or three of the OSI model. So there's just overall there's ways to exploit. And of course, vulnerabilities with the client. We trick the client into thinking we're the server we want intercepting the request or the reply, impersonating the client to the server. You know, all this hacker faking activities here. There could be a, a proxy server or a firewall or gateway or something you go through. There could be bit weaknesses there. And we think about some key terms with network vulnerability assessments and our methodology and all that. These are really big terms here that are good. Uh, we have risk. The probability that a threat will exploit a vulnerability to adversely affect an information asset. So I guess we're thinking kind of the probability, the likelihood. Threat, an event, the occurrence of which could have an undesired impact basically. And then we call it, we've mentioned threat impact is the magnitude of this loss or harm. 
on some asset that we have and then that value, that asset no longer has the same value. Threat probability, the chance that an event will occur or a specific loss value may be attained should this event occur. Safeguard, we put something in place to mitigate. We sometimes call it a control or a safeguard, a risk-reducing measure that acts to detect, prevent, minimize loss associated with the occurrence of a specific, specified threat or category of threats. Vulnerability, well, we have an absence or weakness of some sort of a risk-reducing safeguard. Okay. Phase one, looking at our data collection. So as we go through this, we'll have to review the applicable state and federal laws affecting a particular client, review the available documentation, look at what's of concern, draw up a list of known bugs and security vulnerabilities to test for in our client environment. We go to phase two. We look at interviews, information reviews, hands-on investigation. And I know there's a whole lot of steps here, but basically a list of steps that should be performed during this phase. I'm just kind of looking through, you know, a lot of, you know, several of these actually. The network vulnerability assessment team defines the roles or functions about which it wants to gather information. The team lead or point of contact develops a schedule, interview schedule. Then they, the client point of contact arranges interviews with appropriate client staff members and provides office space for the network vulnerability assessment team. So for appropriate members of the network, of members of the network vulnerability assessment interview uh, identify appropriate staff members and other identified personnel. So um, we're putting our teams together when we look at this. We have our network vulnerability assessment team, additional documents and additional interviews. It just kind of goes on and on with, won't read all of them, but effectively kind of putting it together, getting your teams together, knowing what you're trying to do and where you can actually go through your process. So we get into analysis in phase three begins with the acquisition of the first document, only ends within the generation of the draft report during phase four. Analysis spans most of the network vulnerability assessment processes. This is a big part of it. And generates a majority of content in the report, such as the risk analysis, the security policy, and the threat analysis. So we do have to prioritize and we have to think about what could cause the most damage to, to our systems because that's going to be a higher priority that we do something about that. So there is a kind of a triage or a priority type thing going on here and looking at the, you know, I guess the criticality of what, what could harm us and, and you know, what's more critical than you know, something else. Then on to risk management. When we think about risk management, to reduce the risk to something we can live with to an acceptable level. And realize risk never goes away completely. Risk cannot be eliminated, but it can be managed. And it really comes down to what is your acceptable level of risk. I mean, you may want to say, I want no risk. Well, you better be ready to pay a whole lot of money. A lot of times that translates into a lot of, a lot of finances and a lot of uh, equipment put in place and configuration and know-how to reduce your risk to a very, very low level. So the risk analysis is an assessment to you want to you first identify your company's assets and then how valuable are these assets. They may have different values. Identify the assets, vulnerabilities, and threats. You know, where the weaknesses are and what could hurt it. Calculate their associated overall risk. What's the potential loss and damages if we were to estimate this and what can we do about it? And obviously, this whole risk management thing probably does sound pretty difficult to do because you are trying to do a lot of guesswork. I mean, think about it. You're trying to predict the future because maybe you're concerned about some sort of threat which happens to be a hurricane coming through and just like messing up buildings and just putting people out of business for a while. But then you're trying to predict, well, are we going to have a really bad hurricane next year? As soon as we go 10 years and we don't have much of anything, and sometimes we have two in one year. So it's a, it's, you have to look at the you know, history to come up with that. And of course, there's just so many variables, and you try to predict what the threats are, what can, you could do about it, and try to just gather information from a lot of sources. There's a lot of unknowns, and um, um, the quantifying, you're putting hard numbers on something that's really hard to put hard numbers on. 
qualitative is usually something you don't really have any hard numbers to work with. You can do surveys and you know and put some opinions in place, but it's a, it's a tough thing. So risk analysis objectives, basically they consider the purpose of a risk analysis is a tool used in risk management and helps ensure the company's security program is cost effective, relevant, and appropriate for what they're really experiencing in their world. So with this, we look also at the value of an asset, and that's a tough one too. You know, what, what did we pay for it? That's one thing. But what would it cost to replace it? And what do we have to do? What was the cost of developing the asset? What would bad guys, adversaries pay for this asset? They may pay a whole lot more than we ever thought of paying for it. What's the cost of maintaining and protecting the asset? Production and productivity losses resulting from the compromise of the asset and the liability of the asset were not protected properly. So that asset may be way more worthwhile, may have a higher number than we ever imagined when we take this into account. And there's all kinds of different policies, you know, and when we think about a policy, and the definition here, high-level statement of enterprise beliefs, goals, and objectives, and a general means for their attainment for a specified subject area. And you could have a general high-level, well, in general, we say policies are high-level, yes, and procedures are the step-by-step, -step, but you may have an overall policy, and then you can actually have all these very specific policies. I mean, you have your general policy program strategic directions of the enterprise for global behavior and assigns resources for implementation. You have topic specific ones for specific issues of concern. You may actually have uh, system or application specific ones for a particular software application or a particular computer system. And of course organizational policy and basically a directive or role of security within the organization. And really, uh, when we think about you know security, security policy, and let's say it's the articulation of the organization's residual risk position. So we start looking at the security controls that govern an organization's information system and stakeholders. So all good security policies must be written, and you know, in one or more of these documents, and it could include maintenance of the least privileged principle through describing stakeholder behavior, excessive, excessive, wasteful, inappropriate, risky access is forbidden, uh, mitigation of organizational liability, preservation and protection of valuable, confidential, and proprietary information from people that should not see that. So, sorry. So when we look at these test questions, kind of going through some true, false, and various questions, a vulnerability assessment is the process of identifying quantifying, prioritizing, or ranking the vulnerabilities of a system. That was pretty reasonable. Yes, it is true. The basic process involves a diligent blank of the target system for any weakness, technical flaws, or vulnerability. And this would be analysis. Vulnerabilities from the perspective of blank blank mean assessing the threats from potential hazards to the population and to the infrastructure. Disaster management. Okay. Okay. Vulnerabilities are documented problems or errors that can be used maliciously to make the system perform in a way unintended. True. The main purpose of a vulnerability assessments are to find out what systems have flaws and take actions to mitigate the risk. True. Let's see, based on our timing, let's we'll see if we can do a little bit of this, of uh, the vulnerability types, because then we'll need to take a little break and get into CISO. 
So we'll just do a little part of this. Critical vulnerabilities, you know, look at some different types. And what are we seeing these weaknesses? We hear about worms and buffer overflows and all these different things. And when we think of some of the critical vulnerability types, we look at a buffer overflow. And essentially, this is something in the programmer's hands, as they put it. Programmer's failure to limit the amount of information that can be written to a predefined buffer. So you, you as a programmer want to take in someone's first name, and you say, I can only take in 15 characters and they try to put 25. We should not allow that, otherwise it overflows the buffers. We should refuse the additional characters they're trying to type in. The uh, directory transversal allows people, if that happens, they, they would be able to move around the directory structure up and down and where we wanted them to stay in one place. Of course, there could be format string attacks, common error in a way in which user supplied data gets processed. Default passwords. Yep, don't want to do that. <laughs> People don't change their default passwords. We look at misconfigurations. Uh, I say more common than not by using the default anonymous credentials for websites through FTP, for example. Just they didn't configure it securely is really what it comes down to. Maybe they left something like that in place where the default anonymous credential actually worked. And that would be obviously a lack of security, so it's a misconfiguration. And, of course, there can be known backdoors also. With known backdoors, they take the form of an installed program and, or may subvert the system through a rootkit. So it's kind of like, I think of a backdoor as a, as a rootkit. I think of it as a Trojan. It's a way to get in your system by some other means. It's not the way you're supposed to come in the system. I think I'm going to go ahead and stop right there with this course with the CVA. And we're going to go ahead and take about a five-minute break, and we're going to start up the CISO. And with the CISO, I'm going to do business continuity. We'll start with there and go into disaster. We'll see if we can get through disaster recovery plan, and we'll just see how far we get. So go ahead and take a five-minute break. Any questions before we take a break? Okay. We'll just go ahead and, uh, and take your break for five minutes then. All right. So now we're doing CISO. Um, should be Module 15, Business Continuity. So it's going to kind of go through this and review this information. So with this, we'll be looking at project initiation, business impact analysis, determining recovery strategies, and writing the plan. So with this, you kind of see it's a flow that we go through all these phases of our plan and just kind of you know, looking through this a little bit. We can see that you know business impact analysis, I would say, is, is really quite important. I think sometimes that's actually the big sell when you convince a company how important it is to have a plan, a business continuity plan and everything. And you know, as you see, kind of looking through these phases and anything, you know, the strategy, development, implementation, you know, you kind of plan development, implementation, testing, and maintenance and all that. But, we find that it's a living document and it's not something, when we put these plans together, it's not like a one-time deal and we just forget about it. So there's definitely, uh, you know, it's important to revisit this and maintain this information and update it as needed. And the point here is that companies really don't have it together. I mean, I know the chapter is called Business Continuity Plan, but then there's a big emphasis on the disaster recovery side and realizing that the, the business continuity plan is really the big picture, and the DRP, disaster recovery plan, is part of it. So it makes sense to talk a little bit about disasters inside of this. And the fact that a lot of companies really don't have a good plan. If they were to experience a disaster, say less than 5% of them would be truly prepared. And 65% of them would actually go out of business if they were closed down for just a week. I mean, you're losing money. Uh, in market share, people aren't too happy with you, not good reputation, you're probably losing customers at that, that moment. So the disaster recovery plan, we think of that as how to rebuild or recover information technology services following an event that disables your normal operations. And a lot of what helps you with that is you had really good backups that were regular and tested. And you know, strategies, you have, a, you have a plan, you know what to do. If this were to happen, we do this. If that were to happen, we do that. And you kind of actually test it and everything. But there's another chapter that kind of digs into the disaster recovery plan a little better. Business continuity planning. And with the business continuity planning, now it's kind of looking at how do we stay in business even if we are in this kind of crippled state. 
how do we at least get the, the bare bones critical business functions running and keep them moving even though we may not be fully up and running and reduce the overall impact of that business interruption. And when I think of disaster recovery plan, and I do think typically more of the catastrophic kind of thing that we're looking at. So we look at these phases, phase one business impact and assessment, and thus we looked at the business analysis, operational impact analysis, and financial. That's one that a lot of times talks to people is the financial. And then, of course, phase two, strategy development, resource requirements, recovery alternatives, you know, there's some other options, and strategy recommendation. And, of course, phase three, the strategy implementation, contracts, provisions, contingency, management, business unit continuity, and infrastructure continuity. So when we have a look at these plans, we have a project initiation, and with anything, when we look at where we start, you want management support. Now, without management support, it's a, lot, a lot of times plans, these plans will fail. So and we may have to really convince them and sell this on to them and say, you know, this is basically, yes, this is what it's going to cost, but this, you know, here's the benefits, and just really convince them how it's going to be worthwhile. And it may be sometimes in some industries, you would, even if the upper management really doesn't want to put effort here, they may end up having to because of regulations force them to. And of course, uh, we, we look at our current issues or vulnerabilities and what happens if we don't implement the plan and business issues of partners insurance, obtaining capital, capital and, um, and we look at this. We, we want to, a lot of these places say, we want to say, show me your BCP. I want to see your plan. Do you have a plan? And of course, seeing your executive management's role, uh, we, they want to act responsibly. You hear terms like due diligence and due care. And essentially, it's a matter of looking into our situation and looking at our vulnerabilities and such, and then trying to take responsible actions to counter any sort of, basically have her act together, have sort of a plan, act responsibly, which gets us to our due care. So really, overall, senior executive management's role is, is big. I mean, we need them to sign on here, but we need their financial uh, help, too. <laughs> They need good support. They need to show that they're with us. And so another employee see that the senior management thinks this is a really important thing to do, that they're on board, that it tends to succeed better. And you know, so they've got a lot of responsibility. So it is kind of a hard sell because all they see is you want money. They're not going to see the direct reward. But it's more of you want to take this money because you're you think all these terrible bad things are going to happen to us. But unfortunately, when I do have students come through that, that tend to have, they talk about their companies and they talk about these great plans they have, um, it's almost, I would say almost every time really, it's because something really bad already happened to that company. We all, I remember listening to one who was talking about how great the plan was, you know, and how he's what he was doing. I was pretty impressed. And then I found out they had a major hit. They had a major uh, problem uh, with one of their locations due to, I think, a hurricane. And, uh, yeah, they like it. it was a wake-up call. And you don't want it to be that way. You don't want it to be you have to take a big financial hit before you can convince them that they really need a plan to be in place. So, for instance, a plan company could have to shut the doors forever if you're not prepared. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of tolerance for companies that don't have their act together. I mean, there's too many other competitors. So it, it could be really quite important for your survivability. It could affect your insurance, liability, business opportunities. I mean, just it's a lot of things. You, you really do have to sell them on the idea. Then we put together a BCP committee, Business Continuity Planning Committee, and they will be the group of people that carry out the risk assessment and analysis. You want people from different departments, not just computer tech people or not just management people. You want a little bit of everybody that understands the business. Analysis must be carried out before it's developed, and of course we have to have a coordinator, a leader that will oversee and execute this analysis and testing and development and so on. So, and kind of moving on with this, uh, we look, move on to the risk analysis with the business impact analysis part of it. So we find out what systems are really, what are functions and systems and all that are considered critical. So identify the company's critical business functions. Identify resources these functions depend on. There could be dependencies. You, work, you say this is important, but you forget that this thing that is important needs something else to be in place. And if that's not in place, this important item will not run. 
So maybe it's a server. Well, if we don't have power, then the server doesn't run. Okay. And calculate how long these functions could be without these resources that they need. And, you know, because maybe this function will not run if this other item is not in place, such as electricity. And, of course, vulnerabilities and threats that could, what are the weaknesses and what are the bad guys or situations that could harm this asset, for example. And, uh, you know, do some calculations, kind of put it all together. And we think about these uh, threats. They're not all like hackers. I mean, yes, there's some that are man-made and they're not still necessarily all hackers. Strikes, riots, fires, terrorism, vandals, hackers. And then, of course, some things just happen. Fires, tornadoes, floods, hurricanes, earthquakes. We have no control over that for the most part. And, of course, technical power went out. Device failed. Loss of communication. You know, we can't completely control everything that happens. And then we try to go through and categorize this a bit. We start looking at some situations are just simply a disruption of a service, a device failed, software stopped working, uh, not a disaster. But then we have disaster where your facility, entire facility is unusable for a day or more. And then catastrophe destroys your facility. And, you know, of course, with this, we may start looking at even an, an alternate location if we've indeed destroyed our facility, it's been destroyed. And it's going to take a lot more planning and you know, kind of a good plan in general to get through this one. How to identify the most critical company functions. If this function, if a function A is not up and running, and you see you just kind of think of different items. If this server's not up, if that server's not up, how, how much will this affect our revenue? How will it affect our production? How much will increase our operational expense? Or what about our reputation if they don't see us, if we don't have good redundancy and they don't see us? And company, you know, if, if the public can figure out we have a problem, then we probably really do have a problem at that point. And it could affect us in a competitive way. We might be violating contracts if we're not up and running. We don't have that access to our employee, to our customers, and so on. So there's there's all these costs that we may not realize that. So quantifying threat damages into impact, and then a lot of times, you know, management does think from a term. Quantifying quantity, hard numbers, a lot of times financial. So we, we have essentially identified the critical functions and resources. And of course we may have a big list of the vulnerabilities and threats. And they essentially kind of look at that and try to map this to potential negative business impacts and you know trying to make some come up with some good solutions on this. And again, there there's obviously interdependencies. I mean that that's a you know difficult part. We may may we manufacture computers, but then we get our motherboards from somebody else, and that somebody else doesn't have their act together, and then we didn't think about getting an alternate to that that motherboard manufacturer that we depended on. So we do most of it, but maybe we still have to get our motherboards from them. So there there definitely can be some interdependencies. And so we may not think of it until things start getting shut down and wonder why it's taking so long for us to get all our parts that we need to build this computer so we can ship it out. So if we're Dell computers and we get our motherboards from somebody else and then we can't seem to get the computer together because they had some catastrophe down there, you know, where they're building the motherboards, then we look bad to our customers, just Dell or Toshiba or whoever, because we're not delivering. And they're not going to care that we say, well, we depend on somebody else. And they're thinking, well, we depend on you. So it's, it's a tough one. And then, of course, you think about, you know, what if, it, what if it cannot run without three of the other departments depend on it? I mean, all these different questions, this depends on that. And, and some things we don't think about. And, of course, which items are critical for certain functions to run? I mean, it might be certain software. It might be communications, electricity, electrical power there. Maybe it's uh, everything's okay except there's been some sort of toxin and we it's not a safe environment for the workers to be in the building. The building looks okay, computers are happy, but people wouldn't be happy there. So, you know, maybe supplies and so on. Then we get into these different definitions. Okay. And we look at you know maximum tolerable downtime. And these are just like kind of made up numbers just to give us something to kind of go off of. But effectively, what's the absolute limit of how long we can be down? That's our maximum tolerable downtime without actually going out of business. And, and of course, you would look at your different resources and, and figure, you know, 
you know, what your limits are, and there may be certain things that is critical, certain items it's urgent, and some items are non-essential and it can wait even as much as 30 days. So effectively with this maximum tolerable downtime, with this, uh, you know, each function resource has to have this, and you look at how critical that resource is, and which gives you an idea of how quickly to get resources brought, brought you know, brought back online. And, and you may have some, you know, alternate facility to go to. You may have some good backups to get you back on your feet quicker. You may have hot swappable devices. Then we have the recovery point objective, and with that, that's a calculation of maximum data loss. So that really kind of goes back to your backups, and based on how rapid your backups are you know, that could give you your recovery point objective. So it defines the most current state of data upon recovery, dealing with really depending on your backups. Okay. And then kind of moving forward with this recovery strategy. And of course, this is looking at your business impact analysis, which can be different for different departments. This, uh, in looking at this, uh, we want, when you think about recoverability, we would like it to be much quicker than the maximum tolerable downtime. And you're setting, you know, your recovery time objective. It's a goal of when you're going to get back on your feet, not your absolute limit of how long it's going to take you. What items need to be considered in a recovery? I mean, you look these things over, you review these. The primary facility recovery and backup sites, you know, if the site goes down, where do we go? Where should processing take place? What about people? People will run the computers, so that's that's something we very much need to make sure they can be available. And of course, hardware replacements, and perhaps we have some legacy equipment, and it may be really hard to get that. And there could be that equipment that's older, and there could be service level agreements that we have to deal with, and finding having the software to put in place to get back on our feet. Communication, different entities after disaster, customers, stockholders, suppliers, media, looting and fraudulent activities, legal responsibilities, and employees' responsibilities to families. And you know, sometimes they can't just go where you need them to go because you're having a disaster because they have family to take care of also. Then we have, if we think of alternate facilities, we think of a hot site. And this one's ready the quickest. And with this, a hot site, Ready for data process in a few hours or less. That's that's how I've seen that quote in many places, something close to that. And it just has the, the core systems, necessary systems, devices, software, and just needs people and data backups. And you can test this annually once a year. And obviously very expensive subscription service. Then you move on to the warm site. This could be ready for processing in a day or longer. Has some peripheral equipment, really needs to be populated with computer devices, software, people, and data backups. Better choices for uh, companies with proprietary software or hardware, but still it's not as expensive as, you know, a hot site. And could have a cold site. And this is just really like having a place to move into. I mean, it's an empty building, no equipment. It has the usual. I mean, if you're going to move into a place, it needs electrical wiring, air conditioning, plumbing, flooring. And about two weeks to get into a functional order, it is obviously your cheapest. Okay, compatibility issues with off-site facility, and with this, you know, we look at hardware and software should be compatible and tested, and you, you do want to make sure that's okay, and if it's not tested, it's going to be a rude awakening. So it's, it is critical that all components work together at the time of need, and now, in other words, test it ahead of time and not wait till then to find out that you have a problem. So uh, if the off-site facility or a company does a software upgrade or they get new computers, technology refresh, compatibility needs to be verified again. Can electronic vaulting or remote drilling recover the off-site facilities? We're talking about alternate locations that we're moving our information to, our backups, sometimes real-time backups. And of course, uh, we may have take backups as well. Uh, you know, of course, with warm sites, you would actually test on equipment at company and hot site. You test on equip equipment at the hot site because the hot site actually has equipment, and the warm site doesn't have equipment except for peripherals, so you obviously can't test it at the actual site with the warm site. Okay, so how does the BCP team decide what type of subscription server is best for the company? Well. I guess it depends. This is not hard numbers, but these are just examples that you could kind of come up with your own little analysis. 
and figure out how much you're going to lose per day. And that could really pull you toward, when you think about your loss, that it may be justifiable to go for a hot site, or maybe it's only justifiable to go to a, a warm site or even a cold site based on how much money you think you would lose if you were shut down for a certain period of time. And of course, uh, you know, we have with us, we look at uh, reciprocal agreements, and you can have it set up with another company that you'll help them out during a disaster, and they'll help you out during your disaster. But a lot of times, this isn't necessarily enforceable, so don't make it a primary. You could have a redundant site that is owned and maintained by the company. One facility is completely equipped and configured exactly like the primary production site, but this is a lot of money. That's a pretty neat one, though. A uh, rolling hot site truck fully equipped with data process and equipment that you can move around because it's a, a truck. Flexible location. And when you think about, you know, subscription costs, I mean, you just kind of have to weigh it out and, you know, how quick it's going to be there and what are you going to pay for. You get what you pay for. It kind of comes down to that. So there's definitely going to be some fees there. Uh, also on this page they mentioned there's even a marriage site, which is the most expensive, where it ensures virtually 100% availability that you could even have with this. And when you think about your locations with this, you want it far enough away so it's not affected by the same disaster. So maybe we are concerned about hurricanes in Florida. Okay, it wouldn't make sense, I guess, down in Tampa, for example. It wouldn't make sense to have your, your site in Tampa and put your alternate site in, I guess, St. Petersburg or something. You know, you don't want to get them too close together because the same disaster that hit you could hit your backup site and it sure didn't do you a whole lot of good if that does happen. Uh, NIST uh, requirement says at least 25 miles away, but again, in some situations that may not be ample. NIST wanted to do 200 miles away, but apparently that wasn't something people really thought was doable. So, you know, I've heard 50 miles in some sources. Then we think about our priorities, no more priority in disaster recovery. You've got to think about the people. You don't want to put something in the plan that's actually going to harm the safety of the people. So have that priority. Uh, plan objectives, what is the plan supposed to provide? Lays out expected responses to disruptions and disasters. Improves responsiveness of employees in chaotic situations. Because you actually have a plan and you're not going, what do we do, what do we do? Uh, you just kind of like, okay, what does the plan say? We practice this, we know what we're supposed to do. We have written out procedures, you know, we, so it reduces confusion because we have these written procedures and kind of people know what they're supposed to do and hopefully have practiced it. We know who to communicate with. We have a structure there. Expectation of different roles for recovery processes have been established. And we have these procedures that just is very, hopefully, orderly. You know, and also something someone brought up to me that had been in kind of a disaster actually down in Louisiana. The fact that when you really have really well written out procedures, when you're going through these chaotic situations and you're separated from, you know, you're the tech, you're the computer people staying at work trying to deal with the disaster and your family somewhere else, and you don't know their well-being, you're not really sure, there may not be good communication, you're a little bit stressed and you're not really thinking straight. And his comment was, it's really nice to have well-written procedures because you can just follow them. It's kind of like people can drive on autopilot and they're not they're just driving and they're not, even if their mind's a million miles away. It's the same thing. You can follow the procedures and you, you can at least get that done and even though your mind is wondering and <laughs> going every which way. Okay. So then, you know, we think about, and I kind of going on with this, and the actual development of the plan. So we've already carried out a risk assessment analysis. We results of the business impact analysis indicates the objectives of the plan. Now we get to more detail. And when we think about this, uh, when we have planning that we do in general that would be, you know, strategic, long-term, tactical, mid-term, operational, short-term, like daily. So operational, where we deal with certain things, you know, that might be day to day, but certain things are a little longer down the road and, and some things are just way down the road, strategic. And we have to kind of think about all those things. And who is going to do what? So you have to figure out that, obviously. Make the decision that the company declares a disaster and goes into recovery mode. So who, who's going to, you know, are we going to make that decision? Someone has to do a damage assessment and tell the team to execute the appropriate plan. We have these different roles. And you have people, you know, the, the business continuity planning coordinator, you have people that 
maybe be considered the public relations role, so they interact with the, the media. Well, just in general, you guys speak to the media. That's important. You may not want your very stressed, tired computer people who are trying to get the company back on their feet to have to interact and be friendly with the press. Okay, you might want to have somebody separate for that, obviously. Uh, and of course, you know, things that are happening, you know, who's going to be, you know, who are the people that are going to try to bring the primary site back online? Who's going to be over there preparing the off-site facility, making sure that's ready? Who's going to contact the vendors and suppliers, contact the customers, shareholders, partners? Reestablish production environment. Who's going to restore the backups? Who's going to work in the off-site facility? I mean, we can't have one person do all of this. So, you know, we look at these. And of course, executive su succession planning. I mean, with this, is just simply, we have to be realistic and realize there's obviously a hierarchy of people, you know, in different job roles, and there could be a death or resignation. Maybe, a, maybe the company senior executive uh, has just won the lottery. I had a student say, start saying happy stories. Okay, he won the lottery, and he is basically resigned because he doesn't need your company anymore. So that could tear a hole in the organization's fabric creating a leadership vacuum. In other words, we need to have a plan. You know, if this guy's not there, who takes his place? If this guy's here, not there, who takes his place? I mean, just like Star Trek shows and, you know, who takes over, you know, if something happens to the captain as the first officer. I mean, there's an orderly kind of thing there. So we need to be ready to deal with circumstances, whether they won the lottery or, you know, whatever it may be, so that we're not like, oh, no, we don't know what to do. Okay? And you could have many plans with this consist of central plan with many modules as you can see here I mean there could be a variety of different plans that you have in place must be action oriented and when we think about you know business continuity and everything your response teams and recovery teams should be included in you know these different plans and there's, there's quite a few here crisis management incident management business continuity disaster recovery and such a facility and safety and communications and a lot of different ones. But the main thing is to make sure the plan is available. We don't want to hear that the plan was created and it's at that location that just got blown away. Okay, it's gone. It's like, oh, well, the plan's over there. We can't get to it anymore. No, the plan needs to be made available to everyone. Then we think about restoring critical functions and, and having that. It's just having things written out ahead of time so that we don't wait till the incident where we're just like going, uh, uh, what do I do and who's doing what and we're just sitting here wasting a bunch of time because nobody really thought about it before. So we want these procedures on what to do, when to do it, and what order. That's important. To cover several different types of events. Copies of recovery plans should be kept off-site. We need to have them more than one place. Companies with only one copy of the recovery plan risk is destruction because the facility gets destroyed and the plan got destroyed. And we should also be taught, employees should be taught and drilled on locating these plans and putting them into practice. I mean, there should be some testing here. And business continuity plans should include arrangements for recovering services and, and priority. And, of course, you know, things such as the recovery teams deployed, crisis management, your command center, your emergency operations center, make sure that's fully activated, communications plan, relocation to alternate site, and, of course, coordination procedures to look at, too. It's always good to have a toll-free phone number they can call. Where do we get together if we have a problem? We all know to meet up here, an assembly location, coordinated plans for development, and then, of course, establishment of the crisis management team. We need to have a team of people, and you, know, you have your emergency operations center and making sure this information is getting out from the emergency operations center crisis communication plans, and of course, relocation to the alternate facility if, if this becomes necessary. Now, these business company plans, uh, they, they don't just stay good forever. They do become outdated because maybe we wrote them when we had certain equipment, certain software, and we've, we've upgraded our software a couple of times. We've changed computer systems, and some of the instructions just simply don't match anymore. Maybe we merged with another company and they love Mac computers and we're just throwing out all the windows and we're going Mac. You know, who knows? They may, they may mandate it. So it's a completely different world. So, you know, a plan is treated as a one-time project instead of an ongoing process. That's not good. <laughs> There's a reason it comes out of date. You know, and people, we may have in there who to contact 
and the, the, the people you're supposed to contact don't even work any, there anymore because they retired, for example, or moved on. So we need to make sure that people are paying attention and keeping this up to date. You know, add you know this to their job description to make sure that they are keeping this up to date. Integrate the plan into your company audits and just you know take all this you know take all this in and make sure we are keeping this current. So this chapter has been about business continuity planning, looking at project initiation, business impact analysis, determining recovery strategies, and writing the plan. Are there any questions before we uh, end our session? Hopefully you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next week.